Uh, we'll continue that after class. GitHub here. Are we live now? See how many people we've got online. Okay, so it looks like uh, we've got most everybody online here. So welcome everybody. Uh, last time we were doing some really fun stuff. Can everybody hear me? Can everybody see me? Everybody see the screen? Okay, awesome. Okay, so last time we were uh, having fun looking at this cellular automata. Let's see if this program's still on our, our program. We should have this Golly program. Hopefully you've got a chance to really have fun with this world. Um, man, this is some exciting stuff in here. Elon and I were just saying how, how much this is kind of really growing and this field is just really taking off. Um, this I, I really like these self-replicating things. It just kind of remind us what we were looking at last time. Um, this idea of, of a self-replicating entity, you know, and, and what really is the mathematics of life itself. So if we go and we pull up a, a biology textbook, you know, a classic eighth grade biology textbook or something like that, it says, what is life? I, I think it's like a laundry list of like eight or nine things in there, right? And we can rattle along. It's like metabolism, growth, reproduction, energy, all this kind of good stuff, right? And that's a good way to think about it. But there's another kind of more abstract way to think about life. And it's really just anything that can make copies of itself. And it's, it's, it's really because it kind of blurs in between this definition, you know, the sort of biological life and non-biological life. There's a really fascinating TED talk about this. We'll pull up in a minute about the sort of these proto cells and these things that are sort of kind of in between complex chemistry and, and life forms themselves. And science has sort of left this area alone historically, right? Uh, there's this famous joke we were, we were talking about last week where there's a, uh, there's a drunk and he leaves the bar and he's, he's lost his keys and he's looking out and it's dark out and he's, he's looking under the street lamp and a stranger comes up and he says, what are you doing? He says, well, I'm looking for my keys. He says, well, are you, are you sure that you lost them here? He says, no, but if they're not under the street lamp, then I'll never find them. And really, that's like how science itself works. We're only looking where the light is. We've only had these certain tools, right? Mathematics on paper, chemistry equipment with glass and chemicals and so on. And there was only sort of so much. That was the light. That was the lamp light. And we were looking for the answers under the light. We have no idea if that's where the keys even are, but that's the only place we can look. And now that we have these new computer tools, we could start thinking about biology in a very, very different way. And um, I'm just shocked at how, how rich this field is and how much it's developed from von Neumann um, over the last few decades, it's really started to take off and getting people to take it seriously for these abstract models. And so what we have here is we have a set, a set of rules. We're gonna go back and look at how we coded some of these. And then we're gonna look at some continuous versions. But what this is really fantastic, there's a set of rules here. There's 29 different states in this world. And I looked it up, but the transition rules are rather complicated in this particular one. And how von Neumann did this without a computer is, it's extraordinary, right? So maybe there is something about coding on the train. But there's a set of patterns here, and the, the set of patterns basically determine, you know, what color is going to turn on what, based on what its neighbors are. And the most extraordinary thing about this is it's only ever looking at its, the neighbor to the north, the south, the east, and the west. That's it. Some of our other, the game of life, has the eight neighbors. This one just has four neighbors in this model, and it's purely parallel. So I remember when I first started learning about computers decades ago when I was little, I was really fascinated with parallel computing just because it just seemed like an oxymoron. Because when you think about it, when you learn how a computer works, it does things one at a time. So to get a computer to do things more than one thing at a time just hardly even makes any sense. And I'd like to sell their automata because it really truly is that. If, if we can get to the point, and we started can now, to actually build this as a fabric, right? Here we're simulating. Almost everything in this course we're going to be simulating. But you can imagine sort of building a little piece of grid-like architecture made out of semiconductors and things like that that would actually execute this in real time on a real, uh, you know, sort of cellular substrate. Then this thing would run at dizzying speeds, and, and what would that look like? And so if we just run this thing and start looking at this transition pattern here, we get this sort of wild sort of biological circuit that takes off. We can slow it down with plus and minus to kind of watch this thing to go through all these different dizzying amount of states. But if we go and we look at like the protein chemistry, 
in a second with David Goodsell, that we're going to find out that like this is like a lot like what um, this is a lot like what the protein chemistry looks like in the sense that you have these these little wonky machines that have very strange and unfamiliar shapes, but when they all work together, it can kind of swarm out and build this sort of very complex machinery. And so this one is actually going to make a copy of itself. And so this is like a, the, the most primitive life form, mathematical life form you can imagine. It really doesn't do much other than make copies of itself. But there was an interesting point brought up last time about making copies of these. These are called uh, von Neumann universal constructors. And we can see here, there's one, uh, you know, building a copy of itself. But what's really fascinating is you can actually get these things to inherit a mutation and then carry on that mutation. So we could really actually start to think of it as, you know, more than just sort of a, uh, it was a joke. I think it was a, a Garfield cartoon or something. It was like a battery powered, uh, a battery powered battery changer that's only good for changing its own batteries, right? Sort of like life itself. Or there's these famous uh, art pieces where it's like a mechanical thing that oils itself. Have you guys seen these machines? It's like a self-oiling machine, it's sort of an art piece. It's kind of fun. So this, this thing, all it does is make copies of itself. But then this code, you know, it's an arbitrary code. And this is an arbitrary computation. And this thing is sort of an arbitrary, sort of a little 3D printer. And so in the instructions is the instructions for how to 3D print uh, on this thing. And so um, can you guys see that little mouse cursor there? I think you guys can, right? Yeah, we can see it. Okay, yes. good. It, yep. it, takes so, it takes so long to get feedback. It's like talking to Mars, you know, like the rover mission. And so in this in this genome, they've added for this drawing of this flower. And so this first iteration just made the copy of itself, right? But then in, injected, the mutation was added. And now this thing along the way, sometimes it'll stop and it'll draw out that flower. And then it'll continue the process of, of doing it herself, right? And this is sort of what human beings do, right? They make copies of themselves, but they might stop and make art along the way. And so this is really fascinating because now you can imagine what if it made it work better? What if it made it work faster? And so there's this uh, you know, amazing strive to sort of get these, these replicators that do this process as fast as possible. And so you can see this one yeah, uh, is going, going really fast. This Golly program is fantastic because it uses something called hash tables to really speed up the execution of these algorithms. It looks for symmetries and it uses essentially the digital speed of light to know that there's a certain boundary that things cannot interact with outside of a certain range. And so it can very much speed up these algorithms. And so we were running some of these uh, by hand. Was anybody, uh, did anybody find one of these that we didn't get to see that they thought was particularly interesting? Don't be shy. Okay, so I particularly like these clocks, right? So don't be, it's not too late to chime in, right? Just interrupt me at any time. So I like these, these clocks. If we set up this pattern, we get these sort of these spiking. And I think this is really just an amazing example of this idea of emergence, right? Each one of these cells is completely independent. It's only looking at its nearest neighbors. It's only looking at its neighbors. It's completely independent. But somehow we get this sort of macroscopic behavior emerging. And it's like almost like kind of philosophical, right? It's like there is no spoon, right? There is no little circuit there doing these things. So if we look at this one, this is my favorite. And we're gonna run this in, in Python yourself if you haven't already. And this is a little, this is a computer. Well, sorry, it's jumping around on me there. Right, this is a little more. This is a computer made out of a picture, but the computer is only at the larger scale, right? When we zoom in, there is no computer. There is no circuit. There is no thing that does math. There's just these little squares looking at their neighbors. But when we put them in the right pattern, those very simple agents working very simply, looking at just their neighbors, this emergent property of computation shows up at this higher order level. If we go down to the level of the squares, maybe there's nothing there. It's just a little, you know, each square. You might be looking at one by itself. You would have no idea what's happening. But yet now we get this emergent phenomenon of very complicated, you know, buses and 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 error correction and displays and, and arithmetic being done in binary and these seven segment displays. Uh, it's a very fascinating world. And I just think this is really neat, this idea of emergence that you didn't put it in there. It sort of does not exist at one level. If we speed this up here tremendously, we can see this watch this actually start cranking out the prime numbers, right? Can you rattle off the prime numbers that fast? I, I probably, I can't. I can hardly count that fast. 
And so we can really speed this thing up and, and crank it and watch it go. Question? Okay, so that's the, uh, the, the wire world. Let's jump over to our notebook. We have this in, in one of our notebooks if we go down. We have one uh, just for this, it's called Wire World, there it is. So I just love this idea of universality that we get a very simple system. So let's wake this up and remind ourselves, you know, what we're doing here. I think I've said, I, I read recently to, to be a good poet, you have to write a thousand poems. To be a good programmer, you probably have to write as many programs. You're gonna start by reading these programs, right? So go through and read these programs and rewrite them. Right? I want you to develop an aesthetic, and I'd be perfectly happy if your aesthetic is sort of the opposite of mine, and you say, oh, I don't like this the way this code is written, let me rewrite it. That's what you want to learn how to do. Okay, so we have a very simple world that we're going to set up with, these, with this matrix. We're doing this, this convolution operation. We're going to look at some more of that. We're going to do convolution like the whole semester. It's like the coolest, it's like the coolest mathematical thing in the world, probably. And it's very powerful. So we set up this, this world and we set up a loop. We had this, this sort of logic game that we were playing first. We counted the neighbors using convolution. So we're going to take our grid world. We're going to use this F to count the neighbors. And then we did this sort of logic puzzle, this sort of a different way of parallel programming, where we're, we're asking these questions of the whole world at once. And so we're saying, anywhere in the world, raise your hand if you're a zero. And if you raise your hand if you're a zero, then that means true. And so then we're going to say, if you, were, if you raise your hand, now multiply yourself by a zero and go back to the square you were. So raise your hand if you were a zero. If you, if you answered that question, then multiply yourself by a zero and go back into the square you were. And then you ask another question. Raise your hand if you're equal to one. And so it's going through all of these questions all in parallel. And we can see that if you're a one, you would go to a two. If you're a two, you become a three. If you're a three and your, your neighbors are not equal to one, and they're not equal to, then you become three. So it, it seems complicated looking at the rules that way. If you sort of write them by hand, if you just think of the problem logically, they're, they're uh, not that hard to come up with. But I think the most interesting thing is they're sort of randomly found, most of them. So don't stress if you think, well, I wouldn't have come up with those rules to design a circuit. Most of these were sort of found by trial and error. And so if we run this thing, give it a second to generate the animation. Okay, so there it's making our movie clip for us. And there we have our video clip. So now we've run this ourselves, and we get this sort of global behavior of this sort of simulated electron. It's going around like a little car. But if you know any other type of programming, you would think about how you would sort of animate little cars going down a street like this. You would do it in a very, very different style. You would, and, and we'll do that programming with our swarm programming, but you would have a location that represents each piece, and then you would have some sort of you know, force or some sort of momentum, and then you would update that force, and then you would update the time and you would position, and you would sort of move this thing along like a simulated rock falling under gravity or something. And you could add you know, a force to the car and make it move to the right. And we'll do that in our Unity simulations. But what I think is so amazing in the sense like there is no spoon, right? There, there is no little car object. There's just these simple rules and nothing's telling it to move off to the right as a coherent unit, that just happens to emerge out of it. And so we can run this whole thing, uh, run this later so you can actually kind of see these things go yourself. Try to change, see if you can put in a different pattern and see what happens with these simple loops. So if I change the size of that loop, then it'll change sort of how long it has to go in that circle, which depends on how, how that timing. And so now you can make something that you know, is regulated based on that timing. And so it seems complicated, but it's actually much simpler than the way you would get from traditional machine hardware up to a working machine that does something useful like this, counting the prime numbers. Okay, so that's the, that's the wire world. Go and run this yourself, kind of jump in, try to see if you can wrap your head around this because this is really extraordinary. This is a machine hardware that's defined as a photograph. It literally is a photograph itself. And when you run this simple local rule on it, you get a very different pattern. You know, is that how our brain works? Do we, as our brain is, are our cellular neurons like an automaton? I think this is the original reason why von Neumann set out to write this book. Uh, I posted it last time I couldn't find it on the GitHub because I remembered that I couldn't actually post it because the file was too large. So let me go back and show you where that is. 
I, I tried to put the PDF up there, but it was a large file, but it's on the archive. And so if we go here, von Neumann, the theory of self-replicating automata. So von Neumann talks about neurons in this book. This is primarily what he's interested in, is, is neural networks. And this is what they thought of the theory at the time of how neurons work. Oops, I'm not way into that. Um, was about you know these cellular automata. How does they work? What is a brain cell? And they knew that brain cells were like automata and that they only look at their neighbors. This is sort of what Andrew Coward kept talking about. That's sort of all they can do. There's no other way to sort of squeeze in higher level cognitive capabilities into a neuron. Isn't it fair for us to give it more information if we can? In what sense? Well, it only has the information about its neighbors in nature. Yeah. But if we're making a simulation, are we obliged to only? Let oh it yeah, we could make sort of some sort of hyper neuron or something that you know maybe it it might have like a filing cabinet inside of it that can you know just just straight up remember the last fifty things it's seen, or maybe it has a a sort of a little wormhole that can tunnel all the way across the brain and know what some other neuron is doing. Yeah, I mean, I think we can totally think you know of building architectures like that. I think our Andrew Coward brings up some good arguments about that nature kind of knows what it's doing and that it, it converged upon this architecture for a, a really good reason. And I think that's probably true. When we think of all the wacky stuff that nature has sort of accomplished in the few billion years it's been trying, you know, it uses, it uses quantum mechanics to run, you know, uh, chlorophyll. Uh, the birds use quantum mechanics uh, to figure out the navigation. Uh, our smell is actually quantum mechanical. So we have all these sort of weird things. In other words, our brain could use, if we use quantum mechanics to smell, we could certainly have figured out how to use it to think. Is my point. So there's probably something about maybe only letting the neighbors talk to their to their nearest neighbor. Then again, there's these interesting ideas, these these single neurons that kind of span the whole brain, right? That you've got these thin, wispy neurons that can kind of go all the way across the brain. Uh, it's really interesting. There's a whole sort of zoo of these different ne uh, neurons, like these Purkinje cells and all these different things. Who knows how to spell that? Anybody's good at that? Not too bad. And some of the, like, there's, a, there's a whole variety of, of these different kind of cells and who they talk to and what they talk to and how they're connected. And that's not mapped out at all. I mean, this is like what, what sort of Max Planck is, is, is trying to do. Um, but to figure out all these different structures. And what's really neat is the kind of thing, it's, it's sort of related to our random walk. So that's, we had hinted at this thing before called a, a diffusion limited aggregate. And that's in our golly. Let's see if we can find that here. There we go, DLA. That was quick. Let's open this one up. Oops. Oh no, I changed the rule. Oops. I didn't want to do that. I left the circuit on and changed it to the other rule, so it won't be the circuit anymore. It'll be something else. So that was under. Let's see if we can find that here. Marigolus, yeah. Okay, so this is a diffusion limit aggregate. So we're talking about the neurons, we're talking about how do they get their shape, how do they know to talk to their neighbors. This is a really, uh, really neat simulation that uh, it's basically gonna do a random walk. So each of the blue ones is doing a random walk. And when they, when they bump into the center pixel, they're gonna start to crystallize. And so this is sort of what a random crystal looks like in some sense, right? An aperiodic crystal um, in two dimensions. And it's neat, it kind of looks like these neurons. And so maybe the neurons just happen to evolve this way, uh, and then that would give them sort of only their, their local neighbors. And so this would be a model of, of why neurons sort of talk to their neighbor. And this is sort of what von Neumann was thinking with the cellular automata. So he said, well, let's just pretend like each neuron lives on a graph paper, and then we can just kind of figure out you know, what they're doing based on how they talk to their neighbors. But he really came up like with this construction arm and all of this crazy stuff that's in the golly. It's just like, wow. How in the world did he do this on paper? Okay, so there's another program uh, called Ready. I hope we got that one. Yeah, here we go. So this is sort of the uh, the cousin of Golly, and this is the continuous version. So let's load this up here. So go through that von Neumann book and the wire world. Okay, so this is the continuous version. So these, these neural network models that... Um, you know, so neat how this stuff shows up over and over again. That we know that the neuron is sort of, it has, it's not completely just a point, right? It, this von Neumann thing, let's just neighbor it as a point talking to its few neighbors. Well, it has these extensions and has these branches and then has signals that go down the branch. And so this is like a really fun program and it can allow us to model a lot of different stuff. 
And one of them they can model is the signals as they go down the branches of the axon. And so these are a different kind of model. They don't use uh, discrete mathematics. They use the continuous mathematics. But if we run this, we can get an, a nice action potential that will actually go down the, uh, this sort of simulated neuron. So here we have sort of one neuron. I can slow it down just like in Gali. And so we have this one neuron that will kind of go down this action potential. And we can see this excitation and inhibition wave. And this came from the study, as you can see from this giant, this, uh, this squid, giant squid neuron. Or as I, I, I like to joke, it's a squid giant neuron, not the giant squid neuron. I just get it backwards. Okay, so uh, what we're going to do is we're going to look at these in two dimensions. And we're going to simulate this model here in Python. Because I, I thought these are really fascinating mathematical models. These are something that traditionally was so advanced, they just don't even teach it to you. But now with a computing machine, we can, we, can get a hand, we can get our hands on this kind of stuff. And so I love this because it's like the coral reef. It's like the fish on the reef. It's like zebra stripes. We were talking last time, you know, how does a zebra get its stripes? And the simple answer would be, well, it's in the DNA, but every cell has the exact same DNA. So how does it decide, you know, where to kind of put those markings? It's really interesting. There's a, there's a great story about, I think it's Robert Sapolsky who talks about this with the, with the zebras and the red paint. Is he the one who talks about that? There's a great story about yeah, some, some, yeah, so there's a great story about the zebras and some scientists were trying to study them. And um, they made the mistake of, of putting a big red splotch on one of the back, on one of the zebra's haunches so they could keep track of it as human scientists so they could know oh, that's, that's Chuck or whatever. Um, and as soon as they did that, the lions, boom, they went right after that zebra. It was just done for. And then they did it a few more times and they realized that the stripes really cause confusion to the lion. And it allows it to, they just see a swarm. They see a blur of a bunch of zebras. And they, their brain really can't make up their mind of which one to actually go after. They're sort of indiscriminate, they're sort of indistinguishable. And there's no way for the lions to coordinate with each other on a social scale to say, we're gonna attack, we're gonna work together to get that lion. Because they don't have language, so they can't specify them. And even if you did, you can't tell them apart. But as soon as it had the red paint, then they could agree on which, uh, which one to go after. And, and so these, this idea of stripes is very important. So the evolutionary pressure to create these kinds of stripes is, is very, very strong. Von Neumann, I mean, uh, Turing was interested in this because he wanted to know the, the, the stripes in the, in the structure of our brain. And so he was very interested in sort of, is this a model for, um, for how we sort of get the, uh, the psych sulci and the gyri in our, in our brain? that somehow we get this sophisticated, uh, you know, computing machinery, but it starts out something very, very simple. And so here we are. This is the one I want, the gray Scott. Uh, so this is the ones that we're going to kind of be modeling, this gray Scott model. And we get these, I like to slow it down, because it's almost like um, mitosis and that sort of thing, uh, in that we have this sort of cellular division. Now, again, there's no sort of macro scale thing. No one programmed in that says, look for a cell-like entity. And, and when cell number 27 gets to a certain size, split it in two. That would be sort of a classical way to program this simulation. And that's not, that's not how they do. These are really, truly mathematical models, which is really, which is really extraordinary. And they're not discrete, but they're also very local. And so there's a whole bunch in here. They keep adding new ones all the time. I would encourage you guys to look and see if there's some cool ones I haven't seen yet. There's no doubt there are. It's like some nice one-dimensional ones. And so these things, so here's smooth life. So here's one that sort of takes the, the life, which sort of tries to make a, a continuous version out of it. Yeah, so I'm in, I'm in, uh, I'm in, in ready program. And I'm looking, uh, I'm, this folder, they've got such many folders, it's easy to get confused. No, I'm sorry, I switched over. It looks just the same. This is the Golly sister program called ready. So you can get this. Thank you, Matt. Let me back up. Sorry, I went too fast. Uh, so if we if we search for Golly Ready, Golly Gang is their um, uh, GitHub, and there's this other program Ready. So you want to get both of these programs on your computer. So they got Windows and Mac there. Um, I got Golly I got Golly to work on Ubuntu, but I haven't tried to get Ready to work on Ubuntu. You can try that yourself. And so this allows it's sort of like the smooth version of Golly. So Golly works on the graph paper, and this, this one works not on the graph paper. And so this allows us to have these other kind of models, right? So here's one in 3D that, that simulates this glider. So here we have sort of a mathematical entity in this space, and if we set this thing up and run this, 
this thing will sort of it's, it sort of scoots itself along. And so this is a pattern that's stable and mobile in this sort of digital physics. So we, we have like a fake universe here. There's Perwins, another one of these gliders. And I think these are really cool. So again, this is kind of like, a, it's just sort of a, a couple chemicals here. So this is a three component reaction diffusion system as it's called. And here we get this sort of emergent behavior. I mean, they look kind of lifelike. They have almost like a, an intentionality there. You can see come a couple of them merge together. It looks more than random. It looks more than chemistry. And I think for a long time, we've had this notion, this idea that, you know, it's just chemicals. What could it possibly do? But we have this intermediate, these complex systems that can do really, really wild stuff with sort of very simple inputs or assumptions. Okay, so what makes us think these, all these computer things are, are real at all though? Um, so if we just Google proto cells, there's a really great talk that'll come up. Uh, let's add TED talk, I guess we wanna do that one. This is probably pretty close. So it's this light, the boundary between life and not life. I don't think I posted this one yet, uh, but I'll post this one onto the GitHub. Definitely go through and watch this talk. This is a fantastic talk. We won't watch the whole thing right now, but I wanna show. If I can get to the right part of the screen. Okay, so here what he's gonna show is they're gonna show a very simple synthetic uh, system. It's just a few chemicals. A, a biological cell is gonna have 5 million chemicals in it. This is just gonna be sometimes, you know, five or a dozen or so. And what we're gonna see is this simple chemical system they're calling protocells. I don't think there's any volume. Oh, you can't hear anything? No, okay. we don't hear anything. Okay, I'll just, I'll, just, I'll just narrate it. Okay, so what he's saying is there, this is a simple protocell system. So this is just chemistry. There's, no, there's nothing alive here. It's just a system of, of a few different chemicals. And what they're going to do is they're going to put these chemicals in there. And this is sort of like a physical model of what we were just looking at in the simulation. And what's sort of really fascinating is sort of the behavior of these things as, it kind of, as these simple chemicals interact. Right. And so it's not a living cell. This is just chemistry itself. But the way chemicals actually interact is not is not straightforward. And so this thing has kind of a movement around. And as you see, they're going to sort of put like a, a, a synthetic of food in there, another chemical, and it will actually sort of walk up the gradient of that chemical. And these sort of surprisingly rich interactions, I guess you would expect. That from the classical theories of how chemistry works, we wouldn't necessarily expect these, this rich of a set of behaviors. If I didn't know better, I would think this is some sort of amoeba or something. Like watch it will now find that blue stuff and it's actually gonna go to the highest point, the concentration, so this optimization, right? Which we're gonna spend a lot of the semester on optimization. And so how in the world does it know to get to the middle of that? And so, so you can see here in the subtitles, he's using sort of a metaphor of like, you know, using its environment and getting resources and, you know, having goals essentially. Now they're gonna put a few of these together and how they interact is really, is really awesome. Now, again, you know, people have been trying for, for hundreds of years to figure out the origins of life itself. And this kind of this bootstrap problem that seems like it doesn't work unless it's already there. Here we have non-living systems that are, you know, engaging in very extraordinary, almost bio biology-like behaviors. Right? If you take a chemistry class and study that, you know, it doesn't account for this. This is not, you know, a product of the classical models in chemistry. See if I can speed this up a little bit. Yeah, so here you can see kind of uh, sort of a, a dynamic on these where they sort of chase each other and then some of them sort of absorb the other. In other words, there's sort of a lot of really exciting stuff in this area of sort of physics in between life and, and not life. So can I ask a question? Um, Please. 
naively, and believe me, it's going to be naive as a kid, but is there have been any measures of information being transferred between, um, like, it's just, it's pretty fascinating that, um, you know, due to the eyes limitations of the interaction between these objects, there seems to be some form of information transfer that's going on um, just outside of something we're seeing. And I don't, <laughs> yeah, I think that I think I think you might be, you know, hitting the nail right on the head in terms of this idea of information that this might be the best way to think about it. And we've we've always thought that information was sort of privileged to minds of a complexity that we are that we're used to like us. But maybe that. Yeah. Like what what is happening here? Right. Do we use I, in other words, like I was saying, I don't think we can use regular physics and regular chemistry to answer to, to study this experiment. I think we're going to have to use something like entropy and information and you know, a possibility, some other, some other kind of theory here. Uh, yeah, I, it, I mean, it, it just seems that there's a, a another medium um, that we're just, again, like that, the drunk guy and under the light that we're just not seeing, but it, it's pretty evident that there's something else, you know, being communicated and, and that could be a, a bad word, but being, you know, that's going on. Yeah, the, the, know, language, the, the, the language is certainly failing us, right? I mean, there's, yeah. cer there's certainly something where we're like, uh, you know, how do we even talk about this? You know, go through and watch this, you know, later yourself up close. Um, it's really extraordinary. And so, you know, you have like these water droplets sorting themselves. Let me see if I can find that one. I think that's on my dividing engine. Um, Dr. Han? Yeah. Um, maybe I missed it, but I don't really understand what are the protocells? So, so they're basically chemistry experiments. They are like the simplest possible um, model, in a sense, for like a little cell, but it's not, it's not alive. It's not protein chemistry. There's no phospholipid bilayers or anything like that. It's sort of little interesting chemical systems that do surprising things. And so they call them proto-cells um, because they act sort of like cells, like, in that, like they move around like little amoebas and stuff, but they're not, you know, they're not traditionally, they're not life forms in the, in the sense. That we would never that we would normally measure them either by the classical definition or the von neumann self-reproduction kind of thing but they can do crazy stuff like so here's one that's sort of going around a maze and so just sort of like how if you set things up right like the world will solve its own problems using physics and so this one goes forward as, as often as it goes backwards but eventually see if i can jump into this thing a bit yeah it'll it'll sort of scoot its way around this maze which doesn't even make any sense it's like it's like a water droplet like what is it even doing um let me see if i can find that one uh, i might have to find this one um yeah I'll, I'll come back to that one so there's a great um on our github There's a, um, there's a great paper on here in the reading section called uh, the history, it's called a dry history of liquid computers. And so this is in the, the PDF here. I think it's called liquid. It's liquid. You can hit download to get the whole PDF. So there's our PDF. And, and this is really fascinating because this, this is slightly different than the proto cell research, but I think I think it's very related. Um, and what this is is like, how do we, you know, what are computers? And we're so used to computers as being electrical and miniature and all of this other stuff. But it really is this abstract thing. And I think it's it's related to like, what are these cells doing? And the question, you know, is there information exchange and all that? You know, what's the right uh, terms to use for these understanding? So this has got a fantastic history. You know, go through this. I will talk a lot about this this later. But let me just kind of jump in. Um, these are sort of, you know, really awesome water computers. We'll, we'll look at those in a minute. But I wanted to jump into this part with this solving the maze. So here what they've done is they've filled this Lego maze with water of one consistency. And then they're pouring milk into the, the start of the maze. And the milk has found the exit. They've done it over here with coffee and cream. And so they filled it up with cream and then filled up the middle with coffee. And the coffee finds its way out. Just because of the density, the difference is in the density. Yeah. 
you know, so when we think about like cognitive process and we think about our brain function, we think about intelligent agents and all that, what if they're like made out of fluid, right? We have hearts and pumps and all kinds of stuff. You know, we're very, we're very much a hydraulic computer, right? The, when we do an fMRI, we're actually studying the, the hydraulic computer itself, the bold reaction network to see how our blood is moving around our, our brain. And we're not even looking at neurons. And so I think this is this, just to show that there's sort of a really extraordinary um, amount of science that just hasn't been explored yet because it fell between the cracks. You know, liquid chemistry is, is largely, you know, liquid physics in a sense is largely of that type. Um, these are the fluidic oscillators. I, when I looked for these some of them over the summer, uh, it, re it read me into a lot of classified research, which was really interesting. We're sort of near classified research, right? So if we type in uh, fluidic, um, let's see, fluidic, uh, what do we look? I could type here. Right here. So this uh, miniature, right? So if we just type in uh, fluidic differential analyzer, you know, how often do you end up in a military server, right? How often does that really pop up on your thing? But here we go, a miniature fluidic differential analyzer. Uh, this is from 1966. Uh, so existing, right, see, da, 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 mechanized digital integrator, da, 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 da. and she's like, oh, I'd like to get this for easy. It's been approved for public release, right? And they say, mur, mur, mur. and they say, well, let's see, I want to look at, I want to go there anyway. They're telling me I don't want to go there, but I want to go there anyway. I can proceed to the military server. And they say, oh, sorry, we didn't actually digitize that for you. So here's a water computer from 1966 that's just, it's not available to you yet, right? Because it's too important, right? And at the same time, people try to tell you it's, it's terribly unimportant. So this microfluidics, these are, this is often called, there's a very big field now called lab on a chip. Uh, this is called microfluidics. And this is a really important area in biology and chemistry because you take, just like we took computers, used to be the size of the building I'm standing in, Chemistry laboratories still are. You can now take the entire chemistry laboratory, you micro miniaturize it, you build it like a computer chip, and now you have an entire laboratory small scale, right? So you can see this one, you know, PCR, test samples, reaction chambers, and so on, right? So this is really, really important, you know, biological, biological physics and, and important for biochemistry and medicine. And so a lot of times we're going to talk about really foundational stuff, and I'll be excited just because it's so abstract and cool. But these things really do have a lot of really practical, um, you know, down to earth consequences on these things. So there's a really cool one. Um, you can just like use like a Sharpie and colored water and you can like sort out these drops. I'll have to find that, that clip later. I think I would have learned how to type somewhere along the way. Yeah, I'll look for that one later. Oh, then maybe here's one of them. It's very dramatic music. All right, so this is what we're modeling in, in Ready, right? So we have a little glider in, in the game of life. They're called little gliders. And so here we have a very simple chemical system that, that does these really complicated behaviors, right? It's like swarm synchrony. Well, you know, what's happening there? Right, this is really outside of sort of mainstream physics and chemistry, as crazy as that sounds. Like, what, what is happening? How is it these little simple... Like basically, you know, like a hundred years ago, they said all oh, tabletop physics is dead. And now we find out that you can do, you know, world-class physics with food coloring and a, and a piece of glass, right? This is like fourth grade stuff, but like science doesn't explain this, right? At least not the, the classical frameworks, right? Do oncologists know about this? Do, do uh, you know, do immune system, you know, scientists know about this, right? Do industrial chemists who you know, are trying to clean up the planet, do they know about this? Now look at this, it's sorting by color. Can we do this for wastewater treatment plant? Can we do this for cleaning up, you know, hazardous spills? This is extraordinary science. This is sort of like missing from the mainstream because you have to have a goofy class like this called methods and complex systems. Because where else do you squeeze in these ideas? This is too wacky. This is too much chemistry to be taught in physics. It's too much physics to be taught in chemistry. 
The mathematicians won't touch this kind of stuff. You know, so where does it go? Okay, so let's jump back to our program. And we have here, we have some of these. We can simulate these. So if you had some food coloring at home, I encourage you to try this stuff. Get a very clean piece of glass and try it. But if not, we can simulate it right here at high speed. And so we can change the concentrations of these chemicals. We can, we can look at what's happening. So with all these programs, you're going to have to run this himself. The way I learned to use a program is I click on every button you see. Go around, look at every little button, see what you can find. There's a whole bunch of different patterns on here. Um, here's one for heat equations. So if you want to simulate physics and you want to figure out, you know, how things are going to cool down over time. Let's see. Yeah. Can you talk more about what the water? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so. Um, um, okay, so really it's this idea of, of physical computing in general, right? Um, in general, sometimes they call this natural computing. I just don't understand like, how, like, how does it, like, what does that even mean, right? And so it's really at this, I think it's at the heart of it, is this idea of an analog computer. And an analog computer has a modern definition in that it, it means it has a continuous signal as opposed to a digital and that it used with smoothly varying signals. But the original definition of an analog computer was that it was an analogy machine, that it was analogous for something else. It was a model you built to represent some other system. And we've lost this, this, this I don't know what it is. I don't know if it's the digital computation is so powerful that we've just forgotten analog or that analog is so powerful they don't want people to even know about it. And it's probably some mixture of the two. And um, this idea of using like a machine to sort stuff. and so. One of my favorites of this is sort of slightly related, but let me see if I can pull this up. And uh, this is what's called spaghetti sort. And so I think what, what you want to do is you want to think about problems in terms of like representing the problem and then, you know, how you can, you can solve this, right? I, I don't have, I lost my picture of myself up here. How do I see myself? I don't know how to get back to the uh, whole video here. Well, you guys can see me up at the lectern, right? So imagine we have some pieces of spaghetti and they're different and they're different lengths. And we want to sort them. So there's a couple different ways that we can do that, right? We can lay them all out in front of us and then we can do sort of a search operation and we can say, we'll bring this one to the front and that one's the tallest and we can sort them around. But there's another way we could do it. With spaghetti, we can stand them all up vertically and then we bring our hand down from the top. That's the tallest piece of spaghetti. We take it off. Then we bring our hand to the top again and we bring it down and then we get to the next tallest piece of spaghetti and so on. And so the problem just kind of disappears if you set your problem up in the right fashion. But if you have these sort of problems like sorting out the lengths of spaghetti, if you just turn them upright and then just use sort of the physics of the length, you will hit the tallest one first. Take it out. Then you will hit the next tallest one. And so you don't have to look for the, like, you can just sort of sort them directly. Um, I think the water computers are kind of like that, right? And that if I want to study a math problem, that there's often ways to set it up such that it sort of becomes a different kind of problem. Let me um, pull that up. I think I had some slides on that. That would be good. Okay, so we have this, this whole other different class of computers, and these are analog computers, and they, they work by storing, like, the thing you're trying to keep track of, you put it into, like, a physical something, right? Um, and so you have, like, a, like a clock, a traditional analog clock. The value is, like, where the hand is on the face. Like, that is the number. And so we do that where we build a machine that where the things are represented in, in sort of moving parts. And so there's this cool little this graph, this thing here, it's called the mighty, it says the mighty analog tree. Right? And over here we see servo mechanisms. These are the original gun directors that Norbert Wiener developed when he, um, when he developed cybernetics. You know, it's kind of scary when it talks about robot safety and all that. They don't realize the very first robots in the world were tied to cannons. Like, that's what they were. Uh, the very first computers, right? The very first computer scientists got their computers from the leftover gun directors. This is where Richard Hamming did it. Uh, then we have differential analyzers. This is what we're going to look at in a second. This was um, Vanny Barr Bush invented this concept called a differential analyzer. And it came from this old-fashioned tool that you could use to measure, measure the distance across maps. 
Matt, you might remember one of these things. It's got a little wheel, and you, there's a planometer, and you put it on the map, and you roll it across, and then you, have, you set the scale. It tells you how many miles you've gone. And so it's, it's the same thing in your car. When you get in your car and you go, you have a little thing that's ticking how many times the wheel has gone around. It's calibrated to the, know the size of the wheel, and then you get a distance measurement. So Vandy Bar Bush took that very simple idea, and uh, they, used, they used to stick them into like a lawnmower type thing. And like you know, measure properties with that kind of thing, and, and then he built this sort of whole class of differential analyzers with that. And you know, water computers would be like the acorn, right? Water computers are like these things that I think go back hundreds and hundreds of years to, to simulate um, you know these these equations. Let's see what that what that looks like. Um, just as a side note, this is kind of a cool thing. Don't don't try to make sense of this right now. I mean, later, please do. But what this is showing is the sort of the relationship between these different areas of physics that all have the same form. And so this is from the area of differential equation. And what we're seeing is you see is mechanical translation, mechanical rotation, thermal heat flow, hydraulic heat flow, magnetics in circuits, acoustic systems, electric, 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 so these different electrical systems. And what they're saying is that there's these common sort of characters that show up in these same, you know, it's like the same actor that shows up in a bunch of different movies. And it's like in one thing they act like this, another thing they act like that. It's just uh, what they were able to do is find this sort of symmetry and that you can build one machine that acts like the other. In other words, you wanted to, if you want to study like a hydraulic dam, you can build a small electric circuit that acts the same as the hydraulic dam. And so people built that. They built these big rooms. So here they're doing a network analyzer. So they wanted to know, you know how power was distributed across the power grid of the entire country. So you can build a tiny little power grid and like actually poke it and watch it and you know add on turn on more lights in one area and see how that power network responds. They did this for uh, here's one for conducting paper. So this is really neat. It actually uses the paper as part of the computer to calculate things. So eventually people started to do these for, for the missile design. So this is really for for doing missile trajectories um, and the, the the NASA Apollo missions. You could simulate on a computer like this. They could do about 50,000 flights per second simulated, but it didn't have any graphics. It didn't simulate the clouds. It didn't simulate a blue sky. It was nothing like Unity. It was just the, the, the rocket was a dot on graph paper. And the simulation meant trace where that dot goes over time. And this is this one literally was here. This is one they used for the Saturn V rocket. I mean, look at this tangle of programs, right? You can imagine. And so we'll get to see in just a second, this is a digital version of the water computer. So here, this one actually had like the display was this little rocket gimbal and it would tilt at the direction that the simulation was saying at each time. So you can kind of see the output, right? That was the screen. It was like this little model of the rocket that would turn in different directions. And so these are, these are physical contraptions. They're not computers in the, in the, in the, in the Turing or the von Neumann sense. We're going to simulate later some um, Turing machines themselves and really look at the digital architecture of, of, of those kinds of machines. This is very different. This is like a toaster. This is like a little like Rube Goldberg machines, right? You ever see those famous Rube Goldberg machines where like, you know, the toaster pops the toast, which moves the little match car, which then lights the candle, which pops the balloon. And like, that's what these things are. They're, they're contraptions. Um, let's just jump over to this one real fast because this is really fun. This, this is kind of a, what computing in the, in the early 70s looks like. Um, so this was a guy who built an analog computer to work on video signals directly. And so you got to love his hat. He's got the coolest hat. And um, what he does is he takes in the video signal. He runs it through this analog computer. And he does these filtering effects in real time. So let me just kind of jump in here a second. He's going to take the video signal. I'll leave it there. He's gonna, you'll watch this later. Um, you can just Google the five-minute ROM through the IT. I'll send the link around. He's going to take the video, and he's going to send it through this, this, this real-time analog computer which is going to mess with those waveforms in real time and do stuff that, that now takes very sophisticated digital, you know, neural network computers to do these kinds of things. And they could do all that in analog. And so that's that, that analog computer. Check out that video later. So this is the differential analyzer that Vannevar, Vannevar Bush built. Uh, they had this at UCLA. They called it the mechanical giant brain. Here you can see the plotting tables would actually put out its answers as a graph. It would plot, you know, had like a 3D pen, 3D plotter arm type pen. Um, and, and, and this thing can do some really sophisticated differential equations. This thing can run differential equations that you cannot possibly solve by hand. And what happened with the uh, math world is these things, I guess, sort of got half classified and, and expensive and became the telecommunications industry and everything else. And the mathematicians in the university just ignored it. They said, no, 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 they were never invented. Let's just keep teaching differential equations as if these don't exist. Well, now we're 100 years into that. 
right? So for a hundred years, we have not taught about how we actually solve differential equations in the real world. And you know, you think, well, this is what they teach in engineering, right? I wish they did, right? But that's not what they do. Engineers have too many important, they have other things to worry about. Uh, so here's some cool thing. Uh, these, uh, working on some, this is one of these cool ones. Um, this one is at uh, Moore School, yeah, Pennsylvania. Here's a, a differential analyzer made out of vacuum tubes. And so uh, some very wealthy banking groups, uh, you know, going back nearly almost 100 years now, they were starting to build these out of vacuum tubes. You can build these out of uh, Plano. So it's, uh, this is like the, uh, the British version of the erector sets. You can build these out of toys. Uh, you can watch this later. Here's a great clip of this thing in action from UCLA. Uh, it's just really awesome to see to watch this thing. And so the spinning of that, right, the fact that variable A is at 0. 0.5 means this thing is rotating half, you know, you know, you know, half a time a second or something, right? That, if it's a value of seven, then that thing is spinning seven times a second. That's what it means to be a seven, right? Now we like stick a little memory spot in the digital computer. And we write in binary code onto the RAM and we encode the, the symbol seven. There, seven is like, I'm going around seven times a second. That's what it means to be a seven. And as you can see, they use them for rockets. There's another video of that same type you can watch. It's really good. Okay, so for the hydraulic metaphor, how is it like a water computer, right? And so these differential equations kind of look like this. We have two different forms. We have the integral form, and then we have differential equation. This kind of looks wonky, but it's not that hard. It says the net change is equal to what comes in minus what goes out. And mathematically, we can set that up really straightforward with the sort of a bathtub model that we can have two knobs, one that we can set with a flow rate. And so we have a calibrated little wheel. We go beep, 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 and open this thing up and we can have it zero, which means no water comes in, or we can have it one, which means 100% of the water comes in. And then we can do the, out, the same thing from the outside. And so now if we have a math problem that says, what's the long-term behavior of this system that brings in this, 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 and this, and it takes out this, this, and this, we can literally just set up a little water system to, to fill it up and to run that kind of experiment. And it will solve just that. Right, and so the, the, the bathtub essentially acts like an integrator. It's this very sophisticated mathematical operation that you remember from, from, from Calc 2 and all, this, this thing called an integration. Well, that's just easy, it's just a bucket. And integration just means you collect it in the bucket. And so certain, it's like the spaghetti sort. So certain things like from a symbolic manipulation point of view, integrals are rather complicated. From a physics, from a physical natural computing, integrals couldn't be simpler. It's just a bucket and you're gonna start storing things in that bucket. And so we can, you know, have things that go in and out of this water, and then we can simulate this. And so these were actually built. These are, there's a famous one called the Moneyac, by, built by Phillips. They have a great um, animation of this. Let me see if I can find the animation. So here's a contraption. This was, I think, in the 60s, 50s or 60s, I think. I think they built it in the 50s. Uh, 49. Yep. Okay, so this device is called the MONIAC. It's sort of a joke off the ENIAC. The ENIAC stands for Electronic Numerical Integrator and Calculator. And this is sort of the money, the MONIAC. And uh, this is a water computer. It's kind of hard to see at this resolution. Watch this at, at home yourself. But you have sort of the main economy, sort of this, this blue waterfall here, right? And then you have, you have savings and you have interest rates and you have these sort of banking sectors. And if you want to put money into a different parts of the economy, you sort of move it all around. Um, and so this is one of the first areas of complex systems really developed in the area of economy. And so to do these kinds of nonlinear mathematics, you cannot solve them on a piece of paper. Math is all about making assumptions. Physics, classical physics on paper is about making assumptions. You cannot actually solve real problems in the world. So you find a problem that's close enough, cross your fingers and hope that's good enough. But now we're past that. To actually get to the moon, those approximations don't work. We cannot use paper math to get to the moon. You have to use computing machinery and approximations. And so here's a system that can approximate the economy in real time, uh, very inexpensive. You have to ask yourself why you've never heard of it before. It's almost as if controlling and understanding the economy would be terribly important. Global structure that's going to process like water, and then they use that to, like, you know, 
Yeah, so there's actually, yeah, I'm trying to find a better version with, with a better resolution. So there's like a graph, there's like a graduated cylinders at different spots that would then you would read off. Um, they're going so fast here. Like forcing, uh, it's not like they're moving the water around. No, they're setting like, so here it says government spending, right? So you set like how much, you know, of whatever you can set, they have parameters and knobs that are basically, they're trying to figure out, you know, fiscal financial policy. And they're using this as a simulation. If we were to set things this way, what would happen? And they would say, oh, well, all the money ended up, all the water ended up in this bucket. No one would care about this sort of thing today, right? So it's still kind of like the federal economy makes sense because you have some global setup, like the pattern, and then you're just going according to like the flow of water. Right? Yeah, it's interesting to think of circuits themselves as sort of abstract automata, right? They even all kind, any kind of, we have a circuit, we have this thing where each node in the circuit is going to do based on what its neighbor and connecting neighbors. But here's sort of a nice animation somebody's made, right? And so you can, you can just talk about, you know, you can add, you can change all of these, these, these knobs about what your assumptions are, right? And so I just think this is an extraordinary, you know, branch of mathematics that was sort of, um, I don't know, too important to be taught. And now we can simulate it, but there's something very, I, I like the water computer. Like it, it brings it home into my brain, right? We're human beings. We're not abstract computers. Maybe you guys are, but I'm not. I need to, like, to have a metaphor in my brain to know like, well, what are we talking about? And then once you can see, oh, we're just filling up a bucket. And when it's full, that's, that's what we're talking about. So we can set up these buckets to do really interesting things. Um, here's one that was uh, set up to, to monitor the weather. And so they set up buckets for temperature and pressure and so on, and actually discovered chaos theory. And so the theory of chaos itself came about by trying to model with one of these. Uh, by this point, by the 80s, you could sort of simulate the water, right? You now use computer water in a sense, right? So we're simulating it on a computer. You don't have to use the water anymore, but they could run that. Um, and here's another one that you can set up for looking at population dynamics. So we can set up this very simple analog computer made out of water, and then we can run this thing, and this will actually look at the population of animals over the years. Amazingly enough, because of the fur trading and trapping industry, that there were these amazing records that were tracked track of how many furs were traded in at the trading posts going back hundreds of years. And so it's, it's a great ecological study look nowadays in that you can see the population dynamics and you get these sort of very interesting um, oscillatory behavior that we can explain using these very simple kind of analog models. Um, so if we go back to that paper, right? So there are some really sophisticated, so here's some uh, hydraulic integrators. This was from 1936. Um, these are Soviet systems. Uh, they were classified for a very long time. Um, this is the money act system. So these are extraordinary. And you have to imagine, you know, they probably didn't stop working on these in 1930. Uh, 30. And then I think it's in this document, they said that, you know, even just publicly that, the digital computers, these were better than digital computers, like through the late 80s kind of thing. I mean, these things worked really well. And that's assuming that they didn't progress in terms of how, of how this technology works. So if you assume micro miniaturization and things like that, that there's probably some very sophisticated um, uh, sort of hydraulic computers at this point. So this paper, definitely go through this. This has got some really cool stuff. We're now going to jump over and look at this reaction diffusion. Um, I think this is just some really fascinating, you know, sort of wave front computing. Um, you know, how do you calculate with sort of these, these patterns of waves that come across? So let's jump, let's jump back over to that. Let's see how much time do we have today. Let's see about this time today. Are there any questions on all this so far? We're going to kind of do lots of this stuff. So, you know. Well, can I yeah, wait, wait. Okay. Yeah, yeah, please. Uh, oh, my God, where is it? Uh, uh, I don't know which part it was. You were talking about. Uh, a different type of computer. Hold on. It was near the uh, lab on chip, local computing, global computing, and error correction. Uh, uh, wave front, wave front computer? Wave front computer in the slides? Yeah, can you go back to the slides for a moment? Yeah, yeah. yeah okay, wait. Um, the one with the tree. Uh, it was, yes, that. And possibly the slide before it. Can you check one slide before this, too? This is the first one, then that's the second one, and that's the third. Okay, yeah, you were saying something here, but I didn't quite catch the first part. Do you, do you remember what you were talking about? I yeah, so I just, I, I just really like this kind of graphic. Um, there's so much to, 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 to take apart here. Um, it's, it's, it says the mighty analog tree. And so it's just trying to kind of put together 
you know, there's so many different things that seem so different and they're not put together in any, there's not like a coherent thing, right? It's like chemistry before the periodic table, right? And so this is kind of cool. So I was saying that there was um, these servo mechanisms was really the concept of steering uh, cannons and, and um, what's called gun yeah. That was it. It was about computers yeah. being connected to cannons. Can you, yeah, can you repeat yeah, that so part? Th these, are, these are called gun directors. And um, these were the very first, you know, sort of, you know, analog computers that were really produced. This is what uh, Padram always talks about with cybernetics. And so this is a guy named Norm Norbert Wiener, um, who was like a prodigy, got his PhD at like 17 or something. And he built these kind of systems and developed this, this uh, technology called cybernetics. And as you can imagine, just by the nature of this, it was classified from the very beginning. It still is. Um, and so it goes by the funny name of fire control. Wait, so that that gun tracks uh, like a moving object? Yes, exactly. So, you know, in the old days, you would have... Um, I had no idea they had the technology back then. Yeah, yeah, right? <laughs> it's been around <laughs> a long time. Right, so this is like 100 years old, and it's exactly that. Like, in other words, the operator could just put the site... They could line the sight up on the airplane and pull the trigger, and a, a, a real gunner would have to sort of lead the shot, right? And so you right. you have to aim where the where the airplane is not because it takes some time for the for the bullet to get there, and so you have to sort of intercept the airplane with the bullet. And the idea is that that's sort of complicated, and people could learn that with lots of practice to learn how to how to lead the thing. But it's but it depends on if it's coming at you or sideways and all that. This is sort of an automatic system. Uh, to do this, it, it didn't so, vision or anything like that. Just to be clear, it wasn't it wasn't tracking in the sense that you would. It would, it would actually detect the trajectory using optic or anything like that to do automatic automated tracking in that sense, right? You, you had well, to the, put it. The, the, radar, the, the radar systems later would have, yeah. I mean, very shortly they would have. Um, you kind of use that, I, but most of these systems you would sort of have someone who would sort of set the. Um, you would set the conditions. So let me show you what this looks like, at least from a boat. Um, if you type in analog computer, there's unfortunately more stuff should come up, but let me see. Um, I think we just type in Navy, it'll come up. Yeah, so this, this introduction to mechanical, analog mechanical computers, this is one of the best um, evilmadscientist.com. That's funny. Uh, so this really kind of shows this in action, these, these, these director kind of systems. Definitely go and watch this. I'll post this link. And so here's kind of the problem from, from the situation of a boat. And so this is a computer, right? Let me back up a bit here. So, um, you know, using gears, this is before, you know, electronic computers in that sense. They weren't fast enough. Um, they weren't even really, really, really around. So this is sort of like the, the differential analyzer on steroids. And what you're going to see is you can see these guys standing around this thing, and they're setting the numbers by, by turning these little cranks, and that sets in the values. And so they're going to set in things like how fast the boat is moving, the direction of the anti Navy boat, the angle they want to go at, and so on. And that computer is going to solve this trigonometry problem. So if you, you, know, if, if you go to an ambitious high school student, you give them 35 minutes, and you have them set this thing out, they can solve this, right? It's just trig and all this kind of stuff, right? It's like freshman physics. But it's pain, right? And that other boat is shooting at you, so you have you know, a few seconds to get this thing done. So they, they mechanize this, and this is what, here they, they're setting in the values. And so you would kind of like, this way Elon's saying, it's not really vision. If these guys are sort of like, you know, keeping the, the dot on the boat kind of a thing. But then this is going to output, um, and then you could see, then, and then they'll say, they'd say, uh, we have a firing solution. And a firing solution would mean that the computer has output and says, we have, we have an answer, no problem. And, then, and then, the, the, then that would actually pull the trigger, which is crazy. Well, a person would pull the trigger, but it would tell you it's ready to pull the trigger. Now, what's really Thank you. That's exactly what I was asking about. That's awesome. Yeah, I don't, I don't think it would actually pull the trigger, but maybe. Um, this now is, if you look at, there's, there's modern systems like this that are, are extremely powerful. You know, you cannot approach uh, like an aircraft carrier with an airplane. You know, it'll take you, it'll, you know, it'll very quickly track onto you and do this kind of stuff. So this is really neat because it shows you, it's kind of like the spaghetti sort of like, how do you do math with machinery, you know? I've got this theme that we've kind of all been lied to about mathematics that you can add fractions with two rulers, right? So get, later get two rulers and just try to add two fractions and it's like mind numbingly simple. And you have to wonder why you learned all this other stuff about fractions in school when they could have just handed you two rulers. So this is really fascinating. I've watched this video a dozen times. Uh, go through this. Um, it really just, it, it's just fascinating. You know, you don't have to just stress about it. Just kind of enjoy it. And it, it shows you like, how do you map math onto a shape Right, so here's a function that they want to compute. Let me back up just a little bit here. 
And so this idea of how do you compute functions with CAMs and, um, you know, they, they have, if they have this shape, then, then this thing will go around and now you have an oscillator. This little pin will go up and down and then back up and down again. So now we have a simple oscillator. And so we can turn this sort of periodic motion into this, you know, um, like a sort of a spiking motion. And then what we can do is we can sort of carve like a wheel or a track in this, or we can make sort of like a logarithm or we can make a sign or, or whatever you need. You can sort of make this function. And that what you do is you sort of, for each value, like at, at value one, I want this value out. When it's two, I want this value out. So it's like a function of 10 different possible inputs, a one-dimensional function. And so what you do is you set the height, the value you want at each possible spot, and then you can carve this thing out. And now if we carve out like a piece of that shape, and now we use that as a cam. Now when we run this thing, it's gonna, uh, it's gonna go up, and then it'll reset. And so this is a relaxation oscillator. And so this is how this like, analog computing turns, you know, how we can read out the numbers. I just think that's fascinating. And so they built very sophisticated systems. You can do this in two dimensions if you carve like a surface. And so this has a two-dimensional input. And so it's like a surface encoded. And basically these things, you know, calculate this kind of, this kind of stuff in real time. So these are these gun director computers. So even if you're not interested in, you know, military warfare at all, I very much encourage you to, to, to look at these because it's just a fascinating um, branch of mathematics that unfortunately just got gobbled up by the industrial military complex, which is sort of the theme of this course. Okay. Um, questions. Do we, do we know sort of to the, the, the level of generalized generalizability that these things ever reach? So I'm, it seems to me that every, all the examples are kind of specialized. There, there's no general purpose, you know, in the von Neumann kind of sense. So you, that, that... Yeah, it's, it's, a great, it's a great point. Um, what's really fascinating, and I, I love, we've got to try to find more about this. So Richard Hamming, you know, talks directly about getting these decommissioned gun directors. And so Richard Hamming was a computer scientist, um, well, really a mathematician because he was before computers at the Bell Laboratories. And he developed um, error correcting codes. And he talks about, you know, begging to get more of these decommissioned so that he could have these in his laboratory because he used them as general purpose differential analyzers. That he sort of, you know, undid the equations of the, like this cannon fire stuff. And he said, well, can we do other equations? And of course they can, they're just, they're computing machines. So um, they, they sort of were deconstructed. Or this is where Hamming really got his, um, his stuff from. He asked for those while he was at Bell Labs. That's yeah. fascinating. Um, yeah. So he, he got some more. He got some, and then he sort of asks for more at some point. He said he wants some more. Um, it's sort of a, a funny, a sort of funny side story. If you if you ever if you ever at yard sale or antique shop, try to find a dictionary from before the war. Uh, you might have saw this was in the documentary that we posted in the other section. And if you find these old documentary, uh, the old dictionary, the definition of a computer was a person. And uh, during the war, there was an occupation called a computer. And it was uh, um, uh, only women could have this job. The men, the men had to go fight. So only women could be the computer job. And, and Hamming talks about that after Hamming worked at Los Alamos with Richard, with Richard Feynman and, and gang to build the atomic bomb. And there he had what he described as a room full of girls. And when he got to, and he tells this story, it's sort of a little bit outdated now. He talks about when he gets to Bell Labs, he, he described, he said, Bell Labs is never going to give me a room full of girls. And what he meant was, how is he ever going to get the computing done? Because to be a computer scientist at that time, you, ha you had a room full of computers, which is a room full of people, and they did your computations. And so he realized that they were never going to give him a room full of people, and so he, had to, he asked for some more decommissioned gun directors. Right? And so it's just really fascinating, this idea that a computer was a person, like a butcher, a baker, or a candlestick maker. It was an occupation you had. Yes, exactly. That's what I was saying. So if you find a dictionary from before the war... Look, see if you can find one from, you know, 100 years ago or so. Go to your grandparents' house and see if they have a really old dictionary or something. And, um, and yeah, then take a look. I think that's, that's fascinating. So I, I really love this, this whole field of analog computing, this idea of natural computing. Um, so really, this could be a, a, a synonym for the title of this course. As you can see here, we have uh, cellular automata is number one in natural computing. We're going to get to neural computation, um, which was sort of disrespected for, for decades, but I think it's because it was classified. Uh, evolutionary computation, which is really just, just unbelievably fascinating. It's sort of analogous to the cellular automata, but to really, really give them genomes and see what you can do. Uh, we're going to spend a lot of time looking at swarm intelligence. We're going to code up 
our own uh, ant colony optimization. We're going to code up our own particle swarm optimization. That's going to be really fun. Artificial immune systems is something really interesting. I studied this at uh, North Carolina before I came down to FAU. There's some really fascinating cybersecurity algorithms that you can develop. And so um, you might have gotten some spam emails from a, like an FAU professor, and it's not actually an FAU professor. This actually happens surprisingly often. Somebody will send an email that looks slightly like a real person at FAU, but it's not. And so you can set up an immune system to actually you know, solve these kinds of problems. Um, there's a fascinating branch called membrane computing, and this is sort of models cells themselves. So a cell is a boundary, and it, it has this semi-permeable membrane, and, and cells are very selective about what can actually dissolve and, and enter across that membrane. And you can actually do computing with that. Uh, as sort of a side note, we're going to talk a lot about complexity at some point and the different uh, complexity classes. Membrane computing can solve exponentially uh, problems that require exponential time. Membrane computers can solve that in polynomial time as long as you provide them with exponential space. And so this idea of trade-off between time and space is, is really at the heart of, of computation. And I think this is really kind of neat because we're gigantic. People are really gigantic compared to the parts we're made of. We are very much like that wire world in that we, you know, the scale of us. Uh, I came, I was looking at this one other um, example of one of the cellular automatas, and they said that model, you cannot view it at any scale because even if you make, it's, it's an operation, it's a sort of a self-replicating cellular automata model in the game of life. But the pattern itself is so large that if you were to make one of the squares a mil, one millimeter by one millimeter, the full pattern would be 15 kilometers across. And so you can't actually look at the whole thing. Um, and so this idea of like how much space do you need to solve the algorithm, I think is really fascinating. And so I think there's some really great sort of next, next century biology at this, at this membrane computing stage. Um, the cognitive computing, that's just like, that's kind of cool stuff about synthetic life. These I'd have to look into some more. There's some really cool stuff about like the jelly computing. This is almost like the liquid computing, like the shape of something itself. There's sort of like the walking, there's the walking robots that automatically go. Let's see what they've got in here for that. Oh, they've got actually DNA in there. Yeah, we can do the traveling salesman with DNA. That's really cool. Let's see what they have in here. Yeah, that was kind of a little bit of a stub. Do you, do you have some type of um, like YouTube video or something that would break this down like in this form, looking at natural computing with like the different, like in every uh, yeah, that's form that's of a, That's a great question. I, I haven't seen, you know, especially because, you know, this, this one won the lottery, right? This neural computation, right? 20 years ago, these were all kind of like the misfits and no one knew what to do with it. And none of the main science, mainstream scientists wanted to study this kind of stuff. Um, and, and this neural computation kind of hit the lottery and left everything else in the dust. And I think what's really exciting is sort of bringing all of this other stuff to the table. Is there a good video on natural computing? Um, I'm going to have to think about that. I did find one recently on analog computing, uh, very recently. I have a certain keywords that I go into Google every once in a while and I see what, what, what shows up. Um, and where did I put that? Because my worry is if I try to, try to read about it that it's just gonna be so mathematical that I'm gonna get lost. Oh, okay, so if you're, you're looking for something that's sort of like a non-mathematical introduction to natural computing. Exactly. I'll post, yeah, I'll post, some, uh, I'll post some books on that. There's some really good ones. Um, there's one, it's like called The Beauty of Computation or something like this. Yeah, I'll, I, have, I have some good books on that. Um, if, you would, if you would do me a favor, send me an email and remind me and say, do you have some of those intro books? And I'll post them to the GitHub. All right, sounds good, thank you. Can I just add on that? What's really surprising yeah. is when you look these things up, it's not like terrible in the way that it is for a bunch of other systems that you find online. Have to have years of vector uh, algebra just to be able to understand it. This is not like that for most of them. It's like yeah, I'm, like, yeah, I'm, yeah, exactly. I'm a really big fan of a sort of like spaghetti sort style map. You can you can you can get away from this high flown mathematics. You know, Hamming talks about he talks about this airplane, and there's two different kinds of integrals that you might be aware of. There's the the classic integral, and there's this sort of fancy integral that mathematicians have made up, um, Lebesgue integral, and it has to do with functions that are you know discontinuous in an infinite number of places, and this kind of fancy stuff. And, and, and Hamming jokes, he's like, well, if you had an airplane that, you know, it, you knew it was going to fly around if it was integral in the one kind, and you didn't, you weren't sure if it was about the other integral, would you still fly in it? You know, and, he, and he's sort of making this joke that we shouldn't let, you know, mathematics get in the real world, in the way of the real world. That the physics is something different, and that we have science is something different, and that mathematics should be this, this language that it's in the service of uh, what we're trying to do, but I think we run the risk of looking into it in its own self, right? And so I, I oscillate on these things a lot. You know, 
So I, I often joke like our math, our real numbers real, and you'll hear me things say things like this, um, or sort of my casual disregard for a classical proof, because it's sort of it's changing, and, and math is changing. And Hamming talks a lot about this in his in his mathematical lecture that a lot of the classical proofs throughout time later they go they go to show the theorem might have been right, the idea was right, but the proofs were wrong. It's sort of the classic classic theorems from from out history. And so I think we're hitting like this new era. We have to think about math differently. We have to think about computing differently. I really like this, you know, you can see artificial life is on here. Um, I really love this natural computing framework. Um, I, think, I think we need to see more, more of it really. So go through this. If there's any requests, we can, we can look at some of this stuff because it, it's almost defined as like the misfits, right? Like quantum gets stuck in here, you know, all kinds of cool stuff. Thank you so much. That was an awesome questions? lecture. No, that was, that was awesome. So jump into this stuff. You know, I mean, really, this course is sort of too much to chew in one in one semester even. So it's really I'm trying to kind of, you know, expose you all to the things I was hoping to encounter. And it took me too long in my career to actually encounter them and encourage everybody to jump into these things, because I really think that this is there's some really, really great stuff. And it wasn't so long ago that people laughed at all of these things, including this one. And no one's laughing at that one now. And so I would encourage everybody you to make a great career looking at the rest of these. It's, I just want to point out that natural computing seems to, in some ways, just be another word for Turing computing complement, right? Anything that's not Turing computing. It, it... It's interesting. Yeah, and I think that's, and that's good. You know, that's a good discussion in itself because, you know, for a lot of people, those are sort of fighting words because for some people, they say, no, Turing is the definition of computing and there's nothing more than Turing. And then other people talk about hypercomputers and hyper Turing and, you know, all this other cool stuff and non Turing algorithms. And I think that's where all the really good research is there, right? I don't think we have the answer to that question yet. Like, and I think, I think a lot of it's going to come in complexity that maybe a Turing machine can simulate everything else, but try to check your email with a Turing machine, right? It just can't. And so what I love is this, this trading problems like this membrane computing. And so remind me next time, we'll talk about these complexity classes and, and, and sort of P and NP and, and how different problems as they scale and the resources as the problem gets bigger. And I like, I really love this idea that the membrane computing can solve these um, NP complete or NP hard problems in polynomial time, as long as you give them enough space, right? But we have a lot of space. There's a ton of outer space and we're very large creatures. So maybe I'm not taking exponential space serious enough, but um, I just really think this is a fascinating idea. If you're not aware, the Scholarpedia is really cool. It's, it's a lot higher quality than Wikipedia. It's unfortunately not quite as popular as it was a few years ago, uh, but it's got some great articles. I encourage everybody to go on to that. They probably have one on natural computing. Um, I just posted something on the chat. Um, it was something that was popular or that became popular like 10 years ago. Um, and it was reconfigurable uh, logic automata or something like that. It was supposed to be computing down to the um, atoms and bits level Fantastic. and so 10 years ago or in the you know uh, yeah about 10 years ago um, and i found out about it because um, there was a kind of a prodigy at mit as a young kid and, and he was making all this noise about it, and this is what he was working on at some point so i was like okay well i'll follow and see what you know see where this goes and then all of a sudden during his i think doctrine he just changed his his major to neuroscience uh -huh. <laughs> and so i was like well and I went looking at what he was doing, and, and, and this is what he was doing and what they were doing in the lab. And now I just realized that most of the, you can't even get the papers now. You, you need to, um, <laughs> you need to uh, have a login. Yeah. Um, but it, well, it was, so I you thought can it was get a login. You can get the login through the library. So as an FAU student, you can get through the FAU library and you can get a lot of these things. Okay. Well, I just want, I, I know people need to go, but um, what my point really is this is symbolic computing. This is con yeah. anything that's not symbolic. I, Turing, I see as, as just having defined, right, it's a mathematical definition of a computer. It wasn't about whether you build it out of a tape or anything like that. And that, you know, it was just symbolic computing, basically, that you have read, write, and, and, and that's and this, it. And this, natural, this is like everything else, like you said. I think that's a good definition. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah. it's crazy. But there's also these subtle points, too, I think, right? Um, you know, sort of taking inspiration, which is kind of cool. And then those that are used on computers to synthesize natural phenomena, and then those that employ natural molecules to compute. I think the third one is the most interesting. The first two are like, oh, cool. Yeah, of course, we're going to look at nature because we've got good ideas. The third one is like, no, 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 no. The spaghetti will sort itself. So thank you all for your time and attention today. Um, take a look at these links. You know, be sure to run this stuff yourself. you got to kind of 
uh, play around, go download Golly, click on everything you see, download Ready, click on everything you see, and, and let us know next time what you found. All right, thank you, everybody. We'll see you thank on you. Thursday. I'm going to stop the recording. Thank you. Thanks, Elon. Same link.